a seat if you want it. Can I get this thing to go up high like Lenny Kilmister? Uh, <laughs> no. no, this is good. This is good. Yeah. So yeah, my name is uh, Rob Minowski. I'm going to be presenting for the uh, Zeitgeist Movement on Z-Day. Thank you guys all for coming. We're glad that everyone made it out today, and especially all the speakers, um, to get everybody's perspectives. I think it was uh, really insightful, the amount of information coming out so far. Um, and I thought for a presentation, since we already have so many people speaking about you know, the, the, the ills of society, problems with the 1%, things like that, that if I was to do that like I did last year with all my economic data and everything, it <clears throat> might be a little overkill or, or, is that coming through okay? A little quiet? Okay. You're kind of talking into the mic, you're kind of talking past it. Well, it's hard because I have notes, which I haven't done before. Usually I just go off the cuff and, uh, there we go, now it's right in my face. <laughs> right. So, I'll just begin. This is, uh, uh, the presentation is called An Exercise in Analogy. And I can't see behind myself, so if I start screwing up like on the wrong slide, just wave me down, please. <laughs> um, we'll be discussing a variety of topics here in which we hope to evolve a new way of looking at the world. We'll be starting from the most basic and moving toward the most complex ideas. Along the way, we'll be using analogy to help concretize the information and hence the train of thought contained within the lecture. I tried to tailor this lecture to any audience, so while I'm trying to be technically correct, I'm also trying not to be overly technical. This has been a philosophical journey for myself <clears throat> and is also the culmination of much work and thought and lots of pages. Oh, I got it, I got it. No, nope. Error. Oh, on the right. I didn't see that. Okay, okay. <clears throat> now, originally I was going to go through a variety of uh, terminologies and uh, some basic philosophy, things like that. But in the uh, interest of time, we're running behind them. I'm kind of just going to skip through all that, maybe show it for a little bit here. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking at... Uh, uh, some natural philosophy, study of reality. We're going to look at uh, the study of humans, technology, civilization, and some including ideas. Um, like I said, there's some terminology, but people should know most of these terms. We'll start by looking at natural philosophy and the uh, study of reality. It's important to note that the fundamental laws by which reality seems to follow are not fully understood, but they seem to suggest that we live in a recursive, fluid, dynamic system which we call the universe, or at least they have, they have <clears throat> since after what physicists believe was a Big Bang. By this I mean that on the most fundamental level, that things tend to stay in the same state of structure or motion, or that everything recurs, or that each state is the consequence of the states that came before that in time, that there is a change due to interaction and entropy across time, that that state, change of state is causal or follows a pattern that emerged before it in time. Therein we see that reality is one, recursive, two, dynamic, 
and three causal. Again, I'm not saying these fundamentals are complete or fully understood, but that they are there, at least in an objective perspective, and available to us to discuss. <clears throat> Consider the analogy of a movie or reel of film, and that each frame of the state of things within that unit of time. Each frame looks like the one before it, or changes, perhaps slightly. And although the final frame at the end of the movie looks very different, in the beginning, you can track the changes or mutations back on the reel or through time. <clears throat> Such we recognize that these things change according to patterns, and information is the pattern that causes change within other patterns. We must concern ourselves with understanding the true nature of information, the pattern that forms other patterns. As Einstein found a relation between energy and matter, information is beginning to be seen more and more as where the difference in them lies. As information gives structure to matter on a fundamental level, and the lack of information is understood as entropy, which seems to have a proportional relationship with, en with energy. The concept of entropy is that things tend to move towards a less complex pattern without the interaction of additional information in an open system. The priority of information will become more clear as I continue this exercise. For now, remember that the change in a pattern is because of the interaction with other patterns, and that those patterns are information, which gives structure and perhaps to us, meaning. This will be key as we continue this lecture. Consider the analogy of the strings of a guitar, that they tend to stay in the same pattern and motionless until struck by the interaction of my hand. Therein they are given the information from the hand and how to change their state and bring about the very bad music that I play. And unfortunately, over a long enough time, the strings will erode as their substance is continually being diffused in the environment through oxidation, which is why I always need, a new, need to buy new strings even if I didn't break them playing heavy metal. Now we've established for this lecture that matter comes from energy, E equals mc squared. And it contains the pattern we call information. We've also established that since the information was needed, or sorry, inserted into the universe by what method I shall not speculate on this lecture, it tends to degrade or evolve or develop in more than one direction. When it devolves from an existent state, we call that entropy as it loses information and diffuses to a more basic state. But information can interact and build up as well by taking energy and matter and converting or even developing a new pattern based off the old one. These interactions result in relatively stable structures we call particles and then atoms, and then molecules. This development of information is what we call evolution. However, parts of the information can always be lost or transcribed incorrectly due to the complexity of interaction, which is what we would call a mutation. I would say that as the patterns become more complex, they are more prone to mutations or loss. This can occur in anything, but is most seen in biology or cultural systems. We will use two analogies here. The first of a tree growing by using the information in its DNA to create new cells by interacting with information in the form of matter and energy which is what is used to move the information from the environment around it in an attempt to preserve its DNA genetic information. Selfishly, of course. The second is the game of telephone played by children, where the original message is distorted or lost by the end of the game. Yet the words do correspond to other similar words in an attempt to conserve the fidelity of the information. Both appear to be a blind, directionless process that favors function over purpose on a large enough space-time scale. However, this basic process has created the stars, galaxies, and you and I. Let us turn to the attempt to understand the human being and his place in all of this. First, we will look at the development of our species, what our structures are, what culture is, and some troubling inherent limitations of ourselves, focusing on our brains. 
The current scientific paradigm is of the opinion that life began 3.7 million years ago according to the process we call evolution. How this started is unimportant for our discourse, no matter its philosophical appeal. Evolution seems to follow the same basic process we've described previously, one of blind interaction and the conservation of pattern or information. This pattern somehow achieved a stable state in the form of genetic information, which is the beginning of the complex structures we call life. Within this pattern is encoded somehow the motivation to conserve information by interacting and collecting information, either through matter, energy, even if these compromise other organisms. As we move through time, we can see this recursive conserved process, which undergoes loss and mutation around us in existing life and in the fossil record. Through the process of birth and death, it has undergone a variety of diverse changes by interaction with other information and what we call the environment, which places constraints on biological evolution and over time selects organisms based on their fitness to conserve their information within that place and time. Out of this process, somehow human beings developed. Poetically and literally, all life, including us, is related to one another in a real, physical way across time and space. Consider the analogy of a family album or genealogy. But as you go farther back in time, they look less and less like you until you go back thousands of generations in a time before humans and you're staring at what looks like a monkey. Farther back, it looks like a mouse. Farther back, a fish, and then a bacteria. How closely related another human in Nepal and Africa must be to yourself to look so similar comparatively. The human being is a marvelous symphony of biological information like all creatures. We have structures that have adapted to their time and place based on their fitness to help conserve information against the constraints of the environment. And so we have evolved arms and legs for their time and place, eyes for their own, and brains for theirs. But that alone does not make a human. For we would not be truly human without another type of information, culture. Aristotle said the essence of man is rational animal. And he was maybe half right, as we will discuss in the next section. But modern science would call a human the result of both genetic information and cultural information, which has developed together, affecting one another. This informational stream resides in our brain and dies with the organism unless it is shared between them via communication, teaching, and learning. Here, as well, we see a further problem, as animals themselves are known to have rudimentary culture, and obviously many have arms and eyes and brains. I hope at this point it should be clear that this recursive, conserving, evolutionary process of information development has left, up, has left us with a vast spectrum of life and information, of which we are only a part and not necessarily on an end point, as there are none truly. Consider the analogy of a map maker placing labels on this spectrum is of great interest to us both scientifically and non-scientifically, but these are only signposts along the road to help us map our surroundings to know where we came from and set our sights on what we may explore. Through sharing culture, human beings have been able to build communication techniques that allow a more richly diverse form of information that can be replicated far faster as well. This information is constrained by two environments, the evolved structures of our brain which were adapted based on their function to conserve and share genetic information, and a new cultural environment that exists in our minds collectively. Culture is shared in discrete units between humans via communication from one brain to the other. There, something wonderful can take place, where cultural information is synthesized, some like what, somewhat like genetic information is, to help alter the fitness of all this hyper-complex existing information. However, there is no crucible of life or death here, Instead, the life and death of culture is based on its ability to fit the existing cultural landscape, both within the mind itself and the larger shared cultural structure. Here, discrepancies can occur between humans separated by time and space, which is why words diverged and differentiated in different languages, the same genes diverging across species. Also, as our minds exist in a different time and place, so does the culture contained within them. I don't have the exact same culture as you do, just as we don't have the same genes. Of consequence is that culture has less fidelity than genes, or is more prone to loss and mutation, so it can diverge faster and in fact has more varying levels of constraints depending on our biology, the existing cultural information, and what we would call our imagination. Consider the analogy of a group of people with a series of buckets with sieves in the bottoms of their hands. 
with sand continually dropped in from other buckets. Only those sand grains that fit through the holes make it through the sieve of what our minds expect via communication. Then that sand moves on to a series of buckets that comprise our biological basis for information. The sand that, that makes it through again is dumped into another sieve, into another bucket, and that is the cultural information that you share with other people. Our brains are, of course, limited, as it is a biological structure. Our muscles work against the pull of gravity. Our eyes only see in a finite number of wavelengths. Our ears only hear certain frequencies, all based upon what was needed to conserve our information and exchange it. Our brains are no different. First of all, since we have evolved through accepting and synthesizing cultural information, our brains have evolved as the receivers and transmitters of that information. But as this is a blind process, it doesn't have any capability to say what is good information and what is bad information. It seems to like the culture that fits its function, biased to what has been functional in past generations, as biology attempts to conserve information. If it was good enough for mom and dad, it should be good enough for us, right? Therein we have developed, throughout the untold millennium, a number of what we now call cognitive biases, which constrain information transfer in a number of ways all functional in their time and place. These cognitive biases have enabled us to weave noise from signal, so to speak, to communicate more effectively, to make faster decisions, to adapt to changes more rapidly, and access and obtain more information, and to work together. These have increased our fitness in the environment. However, since cognitive biases evolve to constrain information, they lead to what some might consider irrationality. In fact, many cognitive biases align with what we call logical fallacies or rational thinking. A human is not born rational and then becomes irrational, of course. What we call irrationality is built into the human at the biological level. Animals are not logical creatures. They only react in the way they've been built via their biology and the information they received. The human is no different. If he is only given rational information, he would still at times react irrationally due to these core limitations and would in fact see his own behavior as entirely rational. Here we'll, <laughs> Here we'll look at one of the more important facets of the human, his skill at making and using tools. We will start by looking in, at looking at what technology truly is an understanding. Technology comes from the Greek word for craft or art. When humans or other animals, for that matter, interact with physical reality to create a structure to help themselves, it is technology. In other words, technology provides an extension for biology. A knife cuts through faster and better than nails do. A chair, so we don't have to squat. A calculator does the math for us. Boats open new places for us to explore. There is a trade-off, however. Technology is also the result of our capacity for symbolism, abstraction, and planning. All these things would appear to be positive attributes, but are we so sure? Life existed without these things just fine for billions of years, and while we are very fond of our ideas and the tools they create, they are at the root of the widespread modern environmental damage and a part of the Holocene mass extinction, where we have 1,000 times the number of the rate of extinction on this planet than is normal. Poetically, the devil may be in the details. Just as a uh, historical exercise, this is a series chronologically of some of the major technological advances humanity's been through. Um, about 2.8 million years ago, um, humans in the form of Australopithecines started making stone tools, though well before that we were making tools like chimpanzees make today, I'm sure. Um, just simple wooden sticks to weed out bugs or scoop up water, things like that. But then we tamed fire. The Promethean man, Homo erectus. We made clothing, shelter, weapons, fish hooks, art, music boats for exploration, pottery to contain our food, 
plowing and agriculture, wheels, writing, currency, printed papers, chemistry, locomotion, 